The title is called IEPs, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, What is Missing in Your Child's IEP? This all came about because of our personal experience. In the last 10 years, we have hired many different advocates. We paid a lot of money and haven't always gotten what we really needed from the advocate. We had an advocate that we had been using for a while and had a really extremely negative experience about a year ago where literally 15 minutes before we were ready to walk in, she took my husband and I aside and she said, well, considering pandas and how often he's been in school, blah, 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 he's in sixth grade, mind you, sixth grade, we should take him off the diploma track. He was getting four A's in the C, and we should put him on the certificate track. I literally, tears were just rolling down my face. Usually when I go into the IEP, I'm like, you know, the strong mom, I've been there a whole lot, and I was so embarrassed, and there's us and my husband and the advocate and nine people. And at one point, the social worker actually said, do, do we need to recess for a few minutes? Because I, I kept turning my back on them because I was so embarrassed. And it was just, and, and through that, I actually went to all four of these ladies and a few other friends who were advocates, and I put all the rest of the information out, and they all said, oh, that's ridiculous, you don't do this. Your child is in sixth grade. He had been missing school because of his autoimmune illness, and we just we were not getting the information that we really needed. And so, Carolyn Gamichia, I love this woman. I, I shouldn't put your name out there because now everybody's going to call you because you're so busy. But she literally flew in from Las Vegas early to be at our IEP, the next IEP, because she was concerned about some of the things that were happening, and she was so helpful and gave us amazing, amazing advice. Carolyn works a lot in the autism room and is and also with vaccination choice, and she is, she's gone a lot. But she's, but she's a phone call away and a text away. Yeah. Oh. yeah, she is, yeah. And I'm like, what am I doing? Yeah. <laughs> and, and Nicole is, is also a very good friend. I called Nicole and she says, I'll be there. And has given us just amazing advice. Brenda Mann actually went to one of our last IEP meetings with this individual, and Brenda is an amazing advocate, and she was in a very difficult position because she didn't want to say, oh my gosh, this is not really good, and she didn't quite know what to say, and um, it just, it, it was very difficult. So I guess out of our learnings, what I'd like to say is that if you ever take another advocate in, take them aside later and ask them very pointed questions so that they, they can answer you, because it, it's uncomfortable. They don't want to come and say, oh my gosh, they didn't do this, 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 and we didn't know what to ask. And we're educated, we're parents, we're on, we're on the internet. I mean, it's like a joke. I have my doctor of Google, <laughs> you're doing all this stuff. But my concern has been the medical piece. And we thought we were hiring good advocates and still had questions. Why isn't this working? What's going on? And so really, as a result of our pain and all that happened, we decided we really need to put this panel together and bring in some of these amazing experts. And Carla, Carla has been another phone call away where I've been able to call her. And a couple times she said to me, Oh my gosh, it's a good thing you can't see my face. <laughs> 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 when I, when, yeah, when, when I shared to her some of the things that we've been dealing with, and she actually said the other day, gosh, wouldn't it be something if at your next IEP, all five of us walked in <laughs> <laughs> as my friends, because they all know. <laughs> oh no, Julie and Dana are coming with their friends. <laughs> 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 Yeah, can you sit next to someone and share? Do you want to see it? We do really need to 
have a copy with you. We should be able to do it. We should have enough. Yes. Okay, so what Carla's going to do is she's going to review pages 2 through 7 of the IEP document. It's the contact page, the purpose of the meeting, parental rights, age of majority, the IEP meeting participants, who's going to be there, participants in attendance, eligibility for special education, class, and I'm saying it right? Yeah. Yay! Yeah. 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 And what's going to be different about this is each of them are going to tell us the top three nuggets to take away that they have. And what I want to share with you about the class. Carolyn discovered that for the last several years, and mind you, we've been paying for an advocate, we didn't have PLAF. And they're going to talk about what that is. It's critical. And so, again, I just want to say it is so important to have this information. These ladies are amazing. Um, and with that, I'm going to let Carla go and just get to talk about this piece. Thank you. All right, I'm going to be talking about how to prepare for an IEP meeting and also take it through the plaque. And so the first thing I have to say is, you've got to prepare. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's probably not your favorite thing to do, but the more prepared you are, the more chance for success you're going to have for your child. And I'm going to be giving you basically what, when, when my clients hire me, I'm going to be giving you the advice that I give to them. So, first of all, I really recommend that you request um, your IEP meeting at least a month before you're having it. And also requesting a, a draft of the IEP and any and all evaluations at least five days before the actual IEP meeting. And that's because you really need time to, to look at what the document says, especially evaluations. I don't know about you guys, but I remember, you know, going through like five or six evaluations, and I just, I was, I didn't know what, what they meant, and I was not in a very good position to ask questions at that time. Um, determine a time that works for you and the district, and that's really important. The, 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 the word I want to emphasize is you. A time that works for you. It's not about the convenience of the school district. And um, the, the district may say, well, you know, we've got to have this meeting by you know, Thursday of this week or we're going to be out of compliance. Well, sorry, but, you know, I, I have a job and I can't make it Thursday, so you're, you might be out of compliance. Or I might be able to meet with you for five or ten minutes, sign some documents, and then we reconvene. So there's, there's ways to get around the compliance issue. Um, another big piece that I think is sometimes forgotten is reviewing the IEP invitation. So every time you have an IEP, you should be, the district should be calling you, telling you the purpose of the meeting, who's going to be there. Um, a lot of times they will send a hard copy invitation. And you need to look at that very carefully, and I'll tell you why in a minute. There are five required uh, members of the IEP team, and that's going to be a superintendent, a special ed director, school psychologist, district psychologist, uh, school service providers like OT um, and speech and language pathologists, uh, social workers, at least one general education teacher, and uh, at least uh, one special ed teacher, and then yourself. And what is important about that, and what I see a lot happening, is that general education teachers are being dismissed from the meetings. Or uh, are you are you finding that? or, you know, um, OTs are leaving, you know, and really for the general education teacher or any required member, if they cannot make the time, then I think you should reconvene because you're going to have questions that you're, want to, you're going to want to ask that general education teacher. Superintendent is required? Uh, well, somebody who has the authority to actually make decisions, including, and most importantly, financial decisions, um, you don't, I mean, going to an IEP where you have, you know, not all the right people and, and in terms of authority, you know, it's kind of, it can be sometimes a wasted time because you need someone there who can actually say and commit, yes, we will do that, we will try that. So, so it could be a principal. Uh, principal, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But the principal could do that. Right. I believe so. Yes, I believe so. I'm not 100%. Positive, but I believe so. So I want to tell you something um, 
about one of the reasons why the invitation is so important, and I, this, is a, this happened to me. I got a call from a woman on Friday night. <clears throat> she was frantic. Um, she was having a, a meeting with her school principal and a special ed director to talk about the possible yeah, um, placement of her 10-year-old daughter uh, who was not, cognitive, not cognitively impaired but had some be behavior issues. And she was, as I said, she was going to meet with the principal, special ed director on Monday. She wondered if I could go out there. It's like an hour and a half I drove out there. And um, I said, sure. And, you know, can you please, you know, what does your invitation say? I don't have an invitation. I, this is not going to be an IEP meeting. Are you sure it's not going to be an IEP meeting? Yes, I'm sure. You're positive. Yes, I'm positive. I drive an hour and a half there. We walk into the room, and sure enough, it's an IEP meeting. And I basically had to say, no, <laughs> this is not an IEP meeting because this mother didn't know that this was, this was going to be an IEP meeting. So I ended up um, <clears throat> just basically saying to the, to the folks there, you, you all can go back to your classrooms because we're going to talk with the principal and special ed director. And I think, you know, had I not been there, I think that they would have made a placement decision, and I think that child would have been put in an EI classroom, even though she was not emotionally impaired. So you really, I mean, it's, you need to look at and talk to people, what's the purpose of the meeting? You don't, you don't want a surprise like that. How am I doing on time? Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is, you know, at IEP meetings, I used to feel like, gosh, I'm, you know, my husband and I would be the only ones there. Invite, invite your families. Invite grandparents. Invite aunts, uncles, cousins, nieces. Invite whoever you want. They don't have to say anything. But having them walk into the IEP meeting really sends a message to the district. And what it says is, this child is cared about. Look at all these people who made the time to come here today. And one of the reasons I think it's particularly important or useful to have the grandparents is because you know then they get a then they can get a sense of what what you go through as a parent when you have to go to IEP meetings and they get to know more about your child too. So um, yeah, I mean I think in, there is power in numbers, and I would definitely when when I have my clients um, you know get prepared for IEP meetings, I say I ask you know can you can who can come to the IEP meeting with you? All right, I wanted to say something about um, evaluations and reevaluations. I was recently at an IEP meeting and um, the staff literally said, we don't know what to do with your child. And we don't know what to do with your child. And you know, that speaks volumes to me. And I, I basically said, you know what, if you don't know what to do with your child, guess what? We have, we, he needs or she needs to be reevaluated. You know, because we need to find out what's going on. And then, um, uh, then there's uh, an opportunity to disagree with your district and uh, request in writing an IEE, an independent educational evaluation, to be paid for at district expense. And the evaluator of your choice, not the district's. So then you can have some baseline data. You can have some foundational data by which to you know, proceed um, on that road. The other thing that's important about the baseline data is that, is that you, can, you can monitor it year from year from year. And I think that also some school districts will, um, will, will honor that, will honor that outside data because they know how important it is. What does that stand for again? I, it's independent. Educational Evaluation, IEE, and if you uh, Google Rights Law and say IEE, you'll, you'll find out a lot about it, so. All right, um, here's a nugget. Here's one of those nuggets, and one of the things that I, I advise my clients to do. You know, I, I often find in this life with our kids, 
you know, running. We're to, go, taking them here, taking them there, going to this, going to that, you know, taking care of the husband, the house, and all of that. And I think sometimes we just kind of lose sight of, you know, what we want for our child. So I advise my clients, hey, you know, go out with your significant other for lunch or dinner or something, or a walk, and talk about what do I want for Evan? What do I, you know, after he graduates, do I want him in vocational school? Do I want him in to go to college? Do I, whatever it might be, because it's important to dream, and it's important to, to have a mission, um, and it's important to share that mission with the, your school folk, because your kid's gonna be there from K to 12, and they're gonna be, have a significant influence on that child's life. So, you know, take some time off and, and think about that. Um, let's see. And you can also create a mission statement for your child. And, you know, that's what my husband and I did, created a mission statement, and it was attached to every IEP from, from K through 12. And uh, pretty much he met it. Okay. Okay. All right, so the first page of your IP document, purpose of the meeting, all right? You're going to want to ch uh, check your contact information. Is it correct? Um, again, you, did someone check the correct purpose of the meeting? You don't want any surprises here if they marked a change of placement or a change of eligibility. I pretty much would advise um, stop the meeting there and reconvene because we're gonna need some, we're gonna need to do some homework if they are thinking of, of that. So um, that's what I would say about that. Parental rights, um, that is, I believe, on the next page. Uh, it should say parental rights and age of majority. Okay, um, so once, once a child turns 18, um, the parental rights are transferred to that child. And I want to tell you about something that happened to me that's true, true story. Um, got a call from a woman um, in a district. Her son was supposed to be graduating that year. And she didn't want him to graduate, though. She wanted him to have another year of high school. And the, I believe the special ed director said, well, no, that's, that's not going to happen. And I, and I thought, well, no, that, that is going to happen. Um, so the mother was trying to contact the person who was setting up the IEP meeting, and they just couldn't, they just couldn't get a date. Well, the social worker had that IEP without her. Yes. And um, I was shocked because uh, this young man, um, his, you know, he had the cognitive ability of maybe a third grader. So just know, you know, those things, get, those things can happen, and they do happen. So uh, the good news is he got an extra year of high school. We took care of that. So. Yay! Okay. Um, IEP meeting participants. Um, okay. We talked about this a little bit. Um, you know, basically the people who are supposed to be in, in attendance should be there for the whole duration of your meeting, unless they're excused. So if it's a speech and language pathologist or an OT, you know, sometimes, um, sometimes I will say, okay, you know, you can leave the meeting if we don't really need to ask them any questions. Or, you know, or if they give a report in advance. Um, so that's fine, but some of the other required people, best to keep them in the room. Um, let's see, and I have another little nugget here. Um, okay, um, I just have to say that I question how thorough an IEP is when, when you have your hour is up. So basically what's happening is they're scheduling the parents for one hour and then they dismiss them. So just know that this is your time. You know, this is, you can have as many IEP meetings as it takes to get what you need for your child. The staff may not like it, you know, and you may, it's not particularly convenient for you either, but you know, it's, it is in the best interest 
of your child. And I think that there might be some districts where, you know, they they don't want to continue doing that, but by law, that's what that's what they have to do. Okay. Um, I am going now to eligibility. So there, there are 13 areas of disability, as you all know, I'm not going to read them all. And um, another little piece of information that, I, that has happened, and I'm, I'm giving you these examples because, you know, you can go to Rights Law and read, you know, what happens and all the regulations and all the laws and everything, but I'm trying to make you specific to some of the things that I've experienced in Michigan that you're not going to probably be able to get, you know, anywhere else. So, um, what I'm seeing a lot of is children with autism, ADD, and dyslexia that are having behavioral issues um, are being put into uh, classrooms for children who are emotionally impaired. And, um, you know, <clears throat> the directors, special ed directors, um, have an association, just like any other professionals, they network, you know, they share information. And, you know, I'm pretty sure that these special ed directors are being, you know, told by their administrative people above them, try to contain your costs, try to contain your costs. So they share information, and they share information sometimes that is not in, in our best interest. Would you, would you folks agree with that? Okay, she's laughing. She, uh, yeah, she agrees. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, then the other thing about um, sending children to the e EI classroom or placement as a first stop, you know, there's something called a functional behavioral assessment, FBA, and um, really, before a, before a child is being considered to even move the child, the district should, and by law, must do a functional behavioral assessment, and from that data, then they use that data to create what's called a behavior intervention plan. And the important there, uh, letter there in the BIP is that I, intervention. Catching the child, you know, doing, looking at what's happening with the child before the actual action happens. Um, one of the things about the IE, and I, I may be repeating myself, is that, you know, when, when you're asking for an evaluation, the school district must do their own evaluation first. That's just how it works. But you can always disagree with that evaluation, and that's when you request um, your IEE. You have to put it in writing, and I would do a hard copy, you know. I, sometimes I ask clients to go and hand it off to the administration and make sure that there's an initial so that you know you have proof. But definitely the FBA is really important um, before any kind of change of placement. Okay, so the plaque. That is the next page. Alright, so <clears throat> one of the things, and you you probably already do this, but I just thought I'd mention it is you want, you want to bring to the meeting, as part of your preparation, a list of your child's strengths, a list of your child's areas of weakness, um, what your child likes to do, likes and dislikes, out of the classroom, clubs, um, any kind of description, you know. You want to give a description of how you see your child. It's important. Um, so I'll just leave it at that for that part of it. I'm going to jump to the concerns. There should be a, let's see, uh, I think, I believe it's the second paragraph, the concerns of the parent for enhancing the education of the student. Um, they've only given two lines there, okay? I mean, I'm sure that, you know, probably that's going to take up at least, you know, you've got to have at least three concerns. Um, what I've used that two lines to do is to um, address the concerns that the parent has, they go, they make a list and they actually include that and make a notation on the document 
So they can, they can send in the file with that information, and it's documented in the IEP. And this is also an opportunity to include you know, your outside evaluations and virtually any and all concerns that you have. Um, your concerns are then documented and part of the IEP. And then you send the file to the school and ask them to attach all the necessary documents and reports. And you're going to make a notation in that section referring to the name of the document, who created it, and the date. So should you ever have, you know, a, a, a file a complaint with the state, or God forbid a due process hearing, you have the documents that, um, that basically say what, your, what was happening with your child at that time, that grade and that date. And the districts, by law, they must include that as part of, um, part of the, the document. Okay, um, the plaque. Um, you know, again, does the district have enough information about your child? Do they need to do a reevaluation and find out, you know, what's the child's academic achievement? You know, um, uh, you know what their what their strengths and weaknesses are. And besides the baseline data that after the evaluations they will have, um, you'll, you'll see. I think it's on the next page, yeah. The next page, that first column, that's when I've seen most of the data put for, for the evaluations. And they usually just list their data. Um, and sometimes the, the actual describe the student's academic development and functional needs, that is not really enough detail in there. It, you, need, you need some context around those numbers. The, the numbers themselves are, to me, meaningless. Um, the other thing that I think is important that the districts will sometimes balk at is if you've had an outside evaluation, a neuros neuropsych, <clears throat> you will want that data also included in that column. Because the reason why you requested the IEE was because you didn't agree with the first evaluation. So what you're going to do then is the outside evaluation, that is really the data that you want to use going forward. And really, the, the outside evaluation, you know, I don't know if you've ever noticed it, but when the school does their evaluations, there are no recommendations. They, they can't give recommendations. They're not qualified to give recommendations. So getting an outside evaluator, you know, will list, okay, you know, all the accommodations, suggestions, and suggest, suggestions for assistive technology and, and for services, and all of the things that, um, or many, many of the things that school districts say you can't have, so, or that don't exist. How am I doing? Good? Okay. All right, special factors. That is on the next page. I think it's on. Oh. Oh, there it is. I think it is. Okay. All right, so special factors. The, communi the communication needs of the child must be considered. And in the case of a child who's deaf and hard of hearing, team members must consider the child's language and communication needs opportunities for direct communications with peers and professional personnel in the child's language and communication mode, um, and the full range of needs, including opportunities for direct instruction in the child's language and communication mode. Um, it is important to mention that you know, regardless of what the disability is, IEP teams must consider a child's com communication needs. So, you know, Typically, a child with autism, because it's a, a communications disorder, you know, typically will get speech and language services. Um, but maybe a child, you know, with dyslexia, they, dyslexic kids also uh, benefit from speech and language. Um, so just know that, you know, it, it's not supposed to be a silo. If your child is having a difficult time communicating, and needs uh, speech and language, then that's what the IEP team should do. Oh boy, assistive technology. 
I I am now on. I think it is. It's so hard it, to keep track because yeah. every district is different. Just so right. You know. Special factors was on page four of fourteen. Okay, and I'm on special factors right now, and I'm talking about the need for assistive technology. Page four of fourteen. And you know what's confusing about this? They have two different, two different options that can be used. I'm sorry, I probably should have said that up front. Sorry about that. And also, I mean, um, I've seen districts that don't even comply with these two, and they, they kind of, it, they look different from district to district. But they should, they should include this. You know, this is this is the. The baseline. This is a foundation. So, you know, with your IEP from your district, it might be behoove you to, you know, um, download this, take your or take your uh, IEP and compare and make sure that your district is not leaving out anything important that they should be addressing. So we're we are on page four. We're talking about assistive technology, and um, this is really I don't know about you guys, but boy, this is really hard to get. I think. And part of the reason is because the IEP team has to decide, you know, if they're going to give your child assistive technology. And you only get one vote, maybe two, if, you're, if your significant other is there. And so frequently I've seen, you know, IEP teams say, you know, he or she doesn't need it, and oh, we'll do this, or we'll do that, or whatever. And for some children, uh, like children with dyslexia is very important. Some children, autism, important. And so, you know, one of the things I would say in terms of assistive technology is the law, I mean, the law supports assistive technology for students to get that, that have an IEP. Um, but it's, it's a cost. It's a cost for the district. So anything that's a cost like that, an I, iPad or software or whatever, you know, they're going to block that. And they usually do balk at that. So I would just say, you know, continue to send a le uh, send a letter, request an evaluation for assistive technology. You know, send it to the special ed director, um, email, hard copy, and then they have to do an evaluation. They'll probably come back uh, with the evaluation and say, well, you know, he or she doesn't need it. We don't we don't find that he or she will benefit. Okay. So then, what do you do? Connie Meese, what do you do? What do you do? Ask again, ask the question. Okay, if you get denied uh, assistive technology from your district, the evaluation, what can you do? You can request an independent educational evaluation. Ding, ding, ding. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you do it again, you know, and you just keep, you know, it is a really valuable tool, the IEE. Two minutes, okay. Um, let's see here. Oh gosh. Okay. Can they still refuse after you have an IE that says the child needs it? Pardon me? Can they still refuse the audio the audio after you have an IE that says the child needs it? They can, but be persistent. Well you have to just keep you know, be be persistent, call another IEP team meeting and you know, don't give up. That's a, that's what I would say, don't give up. All right. Um, so for behavior that that impedes the child's learning. Um, the law requires the IEP team to consider spe special factors, including behavior that impedes the child's learning or the learning of other children. And um, that's where you're, you know, your FBA. You're going to request an FBA. And uh, the, the from the FBA and the data, then a behavior intervention plan is created with positive behavior supports. Okay. The whole notion of doing the FBA is to look at what caused the behavior, the negative behavior. What caused Jimmy to, you know, hit the student on the head? Well, maybe Jimmy, you know, doesn't know how to read and the other kid's teasing him and he goes to hit the kid and the teacher sees Jimmy hitting the kid, you know? So there's there's symptoms, there's, there's actually, you can tell by kid, maybe a kid starts getting red, or nervous, or starting to shake, or there's, so there are things that teachers, and paras if they have one, can look at before the child gets to the frustration level where they actually 
you know, hit some, someone and some, or something goes wrong. So, um, I think I'm, oh, well, I'm sorry, but I tried to get through as much as I could. Thank you very much. Your questions were great. <laughs> your index cards for additional questions. Carla had so much to get through. We, we could spend hours just on the little, on the little piece that she was those first seven pages, so she tried to get through like the important like, things you need to know. Carol 